Good morning, buenos dias, and welcome, bienvenido. Delighted to see you here today in person, and for those joining us online, uh, we do ask if, uh, uh, first of all, uh, welcome if there's any visitors here today or folks who are returning uh, after a while. Uh, glad to have you here. Please feel free to fill out the pew pad uh, so that we can have information. Uh, also, too, just a couple quick announcements. The next, this next month, we will be taking up the homeless 
and uh, housing and homeless offering. And so please contribute to this. They do a great work, uh, and they would appreciate uh, any support. Also remain mindful of the stewardship opportunities. We're particularly looking for a pickleball champion, someone who might actually help us with pickleball, and also the playground ministry. These are two things we really want to get up and running, uh, so please help us with that. Uh, also, this last Wednesday, there were 12 of us at communion on uh, Wednesday. We had a delightful time, very meditative, very calm uh, and refreshing. Uh, so I do invite you, uh, if you're looking for something to do midweek, uh, come to our communion service at 5 o'clock in the newly renovated and lovely chapel on which everyone commented how beautiful it was uh, downstairs. Any other announcements? Um, not that I have at the moment other than we are preparing for our Easter egg hunt, which is going to be um, on the 30th, the day before Easter. So um, just put that on your calendars. If you can help, that's great. If you want to um, help by getting us some eggs or some candy to stuff them with, then that's even better. So just let me know if you can help. Please stand as you're able for our call to worship, which is found in your bulletin and on the screen. <clears throat> Lenten travelers, who is this Jesus that we follow? He is the Messiah. What kind of Messiah is Jesus? He is the Messiah who teaches that he will lose his life and who calls us to lose our lives in order to save our lives. How does it feel to follow a Messiah whose teachings and call are so hard and uncomfortable? Some feel fear and anger while others feel uncertain and anxious and still others feel resolute and ready to follow. Linton travelers, we are not alone in our feelings about following Jesus as our Messiah. It is a hard road. The blessing is that we do not travel it alone. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God, God that, that we share this, this journey with, with Jesus and one another as we lose our lives for the sake of the gospel to save our lives through Jesus, Jesus our, our Messiah. Messiah. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy God, what a delight it is to enter this house of worship on this beautiful day, in the beautiful company uh, of those who love you and desire to serve you with their whole heart. Lord God, guide us through this time of worship as we ascribe to you the power that is your due. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And if you join me for our opening hymn this morning, it is number 170, Oh How I Love Jesus. Would the children please come forward for our children's message today?
Okay. I'm going to go right here. Good. So I can see everybody. And everybody can see me. Yay. All right. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good. 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 You ready to keep it going? Yeah. All right. Okay. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, doing some things that are really hard, um, specifically like exercise to keep going, to keep doing. Can you, th so you can get stronger, but um, have you ever tried to exercise like maybe doing some like running, jump, jumping jacks, like at school, do you do jumping jacks, right? How many jumping jacks can you do? 15, five, 10, 10. Can anybody do 50 jumping jacks? You, you can do 50 jumping jacks? Okay. I trust you that you can do 50 jumping jacks. I'm not, I'm not going to make you do 50 jumping jacks, but I want you to tell me how you think you might feel after doing 50 jumping jacks. How are you going to feel? Very tired. Very tired. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Any one of us can say after doing 50 jumping jacks, we're going to be very tired, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this past week, we were on a, I was on a boat, and there was this big wall, and, and it was a rock climbing wall. Have you ever seen one of those? You love them? Are you good at that? Yeah. You're scared of heights. Well, that's, that's a good thing. So you probably don't want to do a rock climbing wall because you have to climb up like really, really high, right? Okay, so, but before you do it, they have to put a harness on you so that just in case you fall and you're afraid of heights, there's somebody to catch you, right? So you don't really have to be afraid of falling, huh? S somebody's going to hold on to you with a rope you have a harness on, and if you fall, they're going to catch you, right? But the first thing you have to do is get your footing, right? You have to get your feet on, on those little notches. And then you have to get your, your hands up and, and you have to lift yourself up, right? You have to use all the muscles in your body, right? First your hands, then your feet, and you have to get one after the other. And sometimes you get tired of holding on, right? Because you're holding on the whole time you're holding on. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, look at how, t how tall this is. I'm never going to get up there. I'm going to be exhausted. But do you keep going? Why? Why do you keep going? What, what motivates you to keep climbing to the top? It's fun. Because it's fun. Yeah? Right? You have that thing. You're going to get to the top. It's exciting. Right? You get tired. Right? What happens when you're like almost to the top and you look down? What did you say, Elise? You get, you get scared, you get frightened right before you reach the top, right? Um, you might not want to go that extra step, right? You might fall down. It's very, very real to feel scared. But even though you might get scared, you might get tired, all these things, do you think people keep going? Yeah. To get really good at rock climbing, you have to keep going. You have to try it and try it and try it again. You have to keep going. Even when you're discouraged, even when you're frightened, even when you are absolutely exhausted. <sighs> Can't do it anymore. So just before Jesus died on the cross, he talked about the difficulty of being a Christian, right? You think being a Christian is like climbing that rock wall? You think it's difficult? It can be sometimes. He said, whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, we talked about this a little bit during Sunday school today, denying yourself, giving up that thing that's your absolute favorite. We had a hard time thinking about that, right? <laughs> Thinking about that thing that we have to give up that we really don't want to. That's difficult. That's like climbing that rock wall. But Jesus was saying that to be his follower, 
there will be difficult times. Just like you're hanging on that ledge. You might feel tired, like you can't go an extra step. You just can't lift yourself up anymore. You might feel discouraged. You're frightened looking down. Don't want to fall down there. But you know if you follow Jesus and trust in Jesus, that he will be the one to lift you up when you are exhausted. He's going to fill you up when you are frightened and give you courage to keep on going. And he's going to make sure that you are surrounded by the love of God in everything you do at all times, which is the greatest of all rewards, right? It is God's love. Let us pray and thank God for his love today. Dear God, thank you for giving us courage. Thank you for lifting us up when we are exhausted and tired and afraid. Lord, help us to remember that your love is with us at all times and gives us the strength we need to keep going. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward for this morning's tithe and offering. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we gather before you today giving thanks and praise for the blessings of this life. You blessed us before, you bless us now, and you will bless us as we go forward. For this we are eternally thankful. Lord, we ask now that you receive back a portion of that which you have entrusted to us, that it may be used here in your kingdom for your good. We ask that you bless the gift, the giver, and all who receive. We ask all of this in the precious holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our lay Bible reading for today is taken from Psalm 121. Hear these words. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carter. At this time, we come to that time in our service when we go together to God in prayer. Though I might be leading the prayer, it is our prayer that we lift up. So I ask that you just get a comfortable position, close your eyes, settle into God's presence, and know that God is here to hear us so that we can rest in his presence. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy God, it really is fun just to spend time with you. Um, Sometimes we get so caught up in life and uh, so caught up in the proper way to pray, the proper way to present ourselves, the right way, the wrong way, instead of just being with you, knowing that you love us, knowing that you accept us as we are, that you're not here to judge us, uh, you're not here to compare us to that person or that person or anyone. Uh, We are simply loved by you. Each of us is the apple of your eye. And Lord God, we thank you for that love. That love that has been with us since you first created us and breathed into us the breath of life and we became living souls. You loved us throughout all time as you continue to Provide ways for us to come back into relationship with you as you made covenants with Israel, trying to bring us back into a relationship of love and service to you. And then, Lord God, you, in a sense, captured our hearts with Jesus Christ, who came to this earth as your son, your beloved son, who taught, who preached, who lived who made friends, who loved, who laughed, who cried, and who died. And Lord God, we know that Jesus' life is for us an example of your love for us. That you want us to understand truth. You want us to understand life. You want us to understand that life at times is one of suffering and hardship. And that, Lord God, we may be called upon to give our all as Jesus gave his all. So Lord God, we pray that we too might be willing to lose our life for your sake, that we might find it. For what would it profit us to gain the whole world, but to lose our life? Lord God, we are here for a breath. We are like flowers upon whom the sun bakes and shrivels away. We are just here for a short time. So, Lord, we ask that you help us to make the most of it, to know that the pursuit of the things of the world, of riches, of glory, of honor, these things are passing. They are nothing compared to what it means to be loved by you and to love our neighbor as you love them. So, Lord God, help us to take up our cross daily, to learn how to set our mind on you, and above all things, to worship you and to love you. Lord God, help us to know that we can make use of this limited time here on earth to develop ourselves, to mature, to be sanctified, to be made perfect in love. So Lord God, help us to make use of this time. Help us to be mindful of ways that we can serve the church, serve one another, how we can find ways to serve you, and be in fellowship with others. And Lord, how to deepen our relationship with you. 
For Lord God, your depth is incomprehensible. It is infinite. We could plummet the depths of your being for eternity and never fully grasp who you are and how much you love us. So Lord God, help us to start now. Why wait until heaven? It ain't worth it. Ain't nobody got time to wait for heaven. You are here now, and we simply want to draw near to you and love you. So bless us all, Father. Be with all those who are present here. Be with our nation and the nations throughout the world. Help us to find paths of peace and reconciliation. Help us to be mindful that we live on one earth, and we have limited resources, and we must learn to share like we all learned in kindergarten. Uh, and that, Lord God, war is not the answer. So help us to be mindful of those places where there is war, where there is famine, limited resources, how to share, how to love, and how to bring resolution to conflict in ways that build us all up uh, into a people that inhabits this one earth, one people. Lord God, be with all those who are on our prayer list. You know all of their needs. Uh, we pray that your peace and your healing presence would surround them all. Lord, we especially lift up Mac at this time with, as we pray over this shawl today. Uh, that you will find healing as he goes to, through rehabilitation, and that you will bring him back into our midst. Lord God, continue to watch over this church. We have a vision. You have shown us the way. You have shown us where we are headed. So Lord, help us now to follow that path, to do the work you have called us to do, uh, to be the hands and feet, as Jim so often says, uh, of the gospel, reaching into our community, uh, that we might go into our community, and that we might connect with our community in your kingdom and that we might learn how to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. Bless us all. And Lord God, we close this time of prayer, this time of prayer, but not our prayer at all, for we are to pray without ceasing. But now we close with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
steps unto heaven all that thou sendest me in mercy given angels to beckon me nearer my God to thee nearer my God to thee And all God's people said, Amen. Am I the only one who might have had just the beginning of a little tear during that song? I bet not. That was beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> well, if you folks haven't figured this out by now about me as your preacher, then you simply may not be listening. Or you may be a visitor. I am in the theological camp that if you want to grow as a Christian, if you want to be transformed into the image of Christ, if you want to live a life in the Spirit in which you experience the fruit of the Spirit, it takes practice. Amen. Have you ever heard me say anything about this? About how we as Christians who want to mature need to practice, practice, practice our spiritual practices? I think you have. Growing spiritually as a Christian is not a process of osmosis, where you just sit back and absorb the Spirit with no effort of your own. If you want to grow spiritually, it takes work. That is, as it says in our gospel for today, if you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. When it says, take up your cross and follow me, to my mind, it is referring to taking up your spiritual practice daily. Today we want to focus on another spiritual practice that we find in our gospel reading for today. And in our reading, it is referred to as setting your mind. In our passage, Jesus is described as speaking openly about how he was to suffer and die and be resurrected. Peter, on hearing this, took Jesus aside and rebuked him. That is, he disagreed with Jesus and tried to tell him to stop saying this. Jesus then turned around and rebuked Peter, saying to him, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on the things of God. You are setting your thought, excuse me, for you are setting your mind not on the things of God, but on the things of the world. And there it is. Today's spiritual practice is about setting your mind on the things of God and not on the things of the world. As to what exactly are the things of God as opposed to the things of the world? Well, I'm not going to give you a list of these three, four, five, six things. A list could be subject to my own bias or my own agenda. And what is considered uh, a thing of God today may be a thing of the world tomorrow, and vice versa. Instead, based on the reading here about saving your life or losing your life for the sake of Jesus or the gospel, it seems that the things of God revolve around a focus on others and on God, whereas the things of the world revolve around a focus on yourself, on myself. When, you set your, mind, when your mind is set on the well-being of others or on advancing the kingdom of God, then your mind is set on the things of God. However, when your mind is set on yourself, where it is all about me and my well-being and my place in the world and my advancement in the world, then your mind is set on the things of the world. If your mind set on others and on God, then your mind is set on the things of God. If your mind is set on yourself, then your mind is set on the things of the world. And whether you know this or not, you have a choice. 
as to what you set your mind on. But let me tell you this. The default setting of your mind is on ourselves. That's the default setting. And it takes a lot of work and practice to rewrite this code, as it were, so that your mind turns from the things of the world to the things of God. But it can be done with hard work and practice. So let's get down to how we might go about rewiring uh, our minds. My teacher would have been happy that I said that R and W correctly. Rewiring. I had to go to school, special school, just to learn how to say R's and W's. But that's a good one. Anyway, <laughs> in Greek, there is one word used for setting your mind, which is in Greek, proneo, which comes from a word indicating the midriff or diaphragm, actually. Properly, though, it captures an idea of how one's inner perspective corresponds to one's outward behavior. That is, what one thinks is reflected in how one acts. So if you want to change how you act, you change what you think. Instead of Descartes' well-known axiom of, I think, therefore I am, it might be better to say, I think, therefore I become. What you think and how you think determines who you become and how you act. As one commentator noted, this Greek idea of phroneo is difficult to translate into English because it combines the visceral and the cognitive aspects of thinking. In the vernacular, one might say it originates in one's gut, as in a gut reaction or a gut instinct, which correlates with the Greek phroneo uh, as a midriff or diaphragm. We all know what these gut reactions are. We are faced with a choice and our gut suggests a course of action or a response. But that gut reaction is not the end of the Greek phroneo, of setting your mind. The gut reaction is just the visceral component. But then there is the cognitive component. That is, we have to ask ourselves whether we should follow our gut. As Viktor Frankl wrote, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Or as Lori Deshane writes, practice the pause. Pause before judging. Pause before assuming. Pause before accusing. Pause whenever you're about to react harshly and you avoid doing and saying things you'll later regret. Practice the pause. There is a space between the event and your response. Now, there's a lot of pop psychology and advice from well-meaning friends that says we should go with your gut. If your gut says something is right for you, then it is right. If your gut says something that is bad for you, then it is bad. Trust your gut, they say, and you will be happy. Which explains uh, why I've spent a lot of money on a spur-of-the-moment purchase, only to find out in the end it doesn't make me happy, and it's just one more thing I need to carry around with me. Or when my gut tells me to go ahead and eat that bag of chips, yet I know that all that salt will be bad for me. Just because your gut tells you to do something doesn't mean it is good. In fact, it could be very bad for you. Like when your gut tells you it'll be fine to have another drink when you know you've already had too many and you need to drive home. Or when your gut tells you to buy that pretty little sports car as your family car when back at home you have five kids and a spouse expecting a minivan. Sound psychology as well as the Bible suggests that good decision making uses both one's gut and one's brain. It is not either or, but it is both and. And sound psychology and the Bible also suggest that one's gut instincts can be sharpened or shaped in some fashion. That learning and experience can strengthen our gut instincts. Think of someone who is a professional baseball player, for example. With many years of training and experience, it is more likely that their gut instinct as to whether to swing at a pitch 
is worth a lot more than ours with no training. The more you cook, the more your instincts will inform you as to what might go with what best. The more you drive, the more your gut will inform you as to whether a given situation is more dangerous than another. The more time you spend with your family and friends, the more your gut will tell you if and when they are troubled. Well, the same is true for our spiritual practices. The more time we spend with God, the more our gut will tell us if something is of God or of the world. This was Peter's problem in our gospel reading for today. Peter had not spent enough time with Jesus to know Jesus and to know what Jesus might or might not want to do. Therefore, when he heard Jesus talking about how he must suffer and die and be resurrected, Peter did not think, but instead responded with his gut, which was telling him that he did not want to lose Jesus, which was more about him and his needs than about Jesus and the work that Jesus had to do. This gut reaction, however, did not come from God or the Holy Spirit, but instead came from who Peter is as a human. That is, it came from his default setting, a weak, sinful, fearful, and short-sighted human who wants to stay in control of the situation. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that kind of rings a bell <laughs> with me. It describes me pretty accurately sometimes. So, was Peter destined to never trust his gut again when it came to the things of God? Absolutely not. Are we never able to trust our gut instincts when it comes to the things of God? Absolutely not. But to transform your gut instincts from a focus on you uh, and your human concerns to a focus on God and God's concerns is going to take work. A lot of work. And the work involved in this is the very thing that separates a mature Christian who can eat the metaphorical meat or tofu of the gospel, as Paul says, from the immature Christian, who, like an infant, can only drink its milk. So, the question I want to present to you today during this Lenten season is, do you want to become a mature Christian? Do you want to eat the metaphorical meat of the gospel? Or do you want to remain a little baby who can only tolerate milk? Well, I think it is the former, to be honest. I think you all want to be mature disciples of Jesus Christ. Because no matter what I say, you keep coming back. <laughs> that says something, doesn't it? I think that means we want to grow. We want to, make, we want to see a difference in our lives. And I say amen to that. Might take some of us longer than others, but we're here. We keep showing up. In order to do this then, to mature as a follower of Jesus Christ and begin this journey of sanctification, of spiritual transformation, you must first set your mind. Yes, you have the ability within you to set your mind, to set your intention, to become resolute in your desire to follow Christ. As Colossians 3.2 says, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In Romans 8, 5 through 6, it says, For those who are in accord with the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who are in accord with the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Death or life? And peace. Where do you set your mind? So we have a choice. We can set our mind on the world, on the flesh, or we can set our mind on God, on the Spirit, on the things above. And just as a reminder, by default, our minds are set on the flesh. So in truth, the only time we actually exercise our free will to choose is when we turn away from the things of the world toward God. Really? I mean, because if our default mind is to the flesh, that's what we do. We have no choice in that. Our only choice to exercise our free will is to turn away from it. And we have a free will. So, the first step is 
Set your mind on God. Set your intention to follow God. Make a commitment deep within yourself that you want the knowledge and relationship with God. You will constantly, at least at first, fall back to your default position of a mind set on the things of the world. You may want to follow God, set your mind on God, but you will constantly fall back to your default position. It's the way it is. So you will have to practice, 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 turning, turning, turning from the things of the world to the things of God. But with practice, 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 your gut instinct will slowly be transformed and it will get easier. First step, set your mind on God. Second step follows from this one. Spend time with God every day in prayer and Bible study. Gather with fellow Christians who have also set their minds to follow Christ. Engage in your spiritual practices that nourish you. Whether that be singing songs of praise, chanting the Psalms, practicing meditation and yoga, listening to uplifting music, volunteering for service to others, meandering meditatively through the woods, practicing gratitude for all you have, reading devotionals, giving faithfully to the church, walking the labyrinth, engaging in social justice, taking pilgrimages, engaging in ceremonies or rituals, journaling, reading and memorizing scriptures. There's got to be something in there <laughs> that speaks to you as a spiritual practice. Make it a spiritual practice. And that's a matter of your mind. I can walk from here to, to Jerusalem and just be a happy-go-lucky tourist. Or I can set my mind that I'm going to walk to Jerusalem because I want to know God. And I want to use that as a spiritual way to develop myself. Whatever you're doing, you can make it spiritual by setting your mind on God and looking for God within it. Even if it's driving your car, guard, if, it's, if it's doing your hobbies, you can do it. So if you follow these two simple steps of setting your mind on God instead of the things of the world and practicing daily your spiritual practices, then with time and commitment and God's abundant grace, which is there to help you, you will find yourself slowly being transformed into a true follower of Jesus Christ, that is, into a mature Christian. As it says in Romans 12, 1 through 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. If everyone would please stand and join me for our closing hymn today. It's located in The Faith We Sing, um, number 2128, or the words will be back here on our, our screen. Come, um, actually, it's 2129. I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning
coming back. I'm not sure I could have come up with a better song to summarize my sermon right there than that one. A um, couple things. We up, have up here this prayer shawl. This is for Mac Tripp. He's in uh, rehab right now, so I ask that you come forward after the service. Just lay your hand on it and just lift, lift up a good thought or prayer uh, for Mac, and that will be delivered to him. Uh, also, too, uh, as is our tradition now, we have a visioning prayer that we like to recite together. And if you're like me, you still haven't learned it yet, but we'll get there. Uh, but it's in your bulletin and on the screen, so let us pray. Dear, Dear God, God, empower, empower us, us to go, go into our community, our community so, so we, we might, might connect, connect with your kingdom, kingdom in ways that encourage us to grow as disciples. As disciples. Amen. Amen. I harp a lot on practicing. I know that. But I am finding after, a, 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 I mean, I have, I have pursued God most of my life. And I have worked at it. And I, as you all many know, I, I practice various practices. Because <laughs> I want to know God. I want to be in relationship with Him. And I'm finding there is fruit to it. It's not just garbage I'm talking about. This is a guaranteed return on your investment. If you're into ROI, this will give you a return on your investment. And so I invite you, take up a practice and keep at it. And you will learn so much about how much God loves you and how much God loves your neighbor and how vast and compreh incomprehensible God is. It is a glorious journey. So I invite you to join in that pilgrimage uh, and know that God loves you. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.